So welcome everyone to this talk. Um, I'm Vinod Kone. I'm a long time Apache Mesos committer and currently tech lead at Twitter. And we have um, the Isabel here who's gonna uh, share the talk with me. And she is a software engineer at uh, Mesosphere. And we're gonna talk about the upcoming new exciting API to Mesos. So I'm gonna start with uh, this. So most of you might be wondering uh, if you have been working with Mesos or using Mesos, uh, when is Mesos 1.0 coming out? Um, so as you probably know, Mesos has been running in production in quite a few large software companies like Twitter and Apple and a lot of other shops out there for quite some time now in production. So what's, uh, what's stopping us from cutting a 1.0? Like why are we holding us ourselves back? And when can you expect 1.0? So hopefully at the end of this talk, you would know our roadmap and uh, hopefully you'll be excited. Um, so let's start off with what are the APIs that we currently provide. Um, so to put this into context for something like a Mesos, which is a distributed system, there are a lot of different moving parts. And based on which part you're interacting with, um, there are different set of APIs that you would use. So if you have a scheduler, you're gonna use the scheduler API to talk to the master. And I just went around and changed all the slave naming to agent, now that Ben made it official on the stage. So I might still say slave if, from old habits, but it's agent now. Um, so scheduler, uh, when it talks to master, it's gonna use a scheduler API, which is like launch task or kill task. And same thing on the executor side, uh, we use the executor API to talk to the agent uh, to do stuff like sending status updates. So the scheduler and executor APIs are typically uh, what we call the framework APIs, and this is what most framework developers would be interacting with to interact with Mesos. And then we have admin API. This is for things like getting statistics out of the system or getting the state of the system from our um, endpoints like state.json or metric snapshot. And of course, there's an internal API that Mesos itself uses between the master and the agent to do the communication. So this all looks peachy and wonderful. So what's, uh, what are some of the problems? Um, so I believe if you want to build a better API, first we need to understand what's um, wrong with the current API, what are the current pain points and drawbacks. So it will enable us to write a better API. So let's look at what are the current flaws or I would say limitations. Um, so the first and biggest thing in my mind is the dependence on the native library. So if you have written a framework um, in Java or Python or something, you have definitely encountered this. So the way it works in Mesos world is you have a scheduler, and let's say it's a Java scheduler. We provide a library um, called mesos.jar that you hook into your um, framework, and then you link this native library called libmesos.so, which is the one that talks to the master to send um, like launch tags and get updates. This is nice. Um, so the original idea of having a native library was that we wanted to abstract a lot of things that frameworks don't want to do, like reliably registering with the master or doing master detection or doing authentication for you and stuff like that. But over the time, we realized that it actually has some problems that are difficult to deal with. For example, if you, are, uh, if you have a performance problem in your scheduler, it's really hard to figure out where the bottleneck is, whether it's in the library or whether it's in the Mesos native library because you can't use your language uh, specific tools to do performance profiling, it's hard. And it's not really portable because the way we currently um, ship our lib Mesos is it brings with it a lot of craft, which you probably don't need if you're a scheduler, they're, they're probably there because the master and slave need, um, agent uh, need them. So this is really, really hard um, to write new frameworks. Um, so we, we wanna get away from this. And the next thing is uh, the way the driver itself talks to Mesos master. And if you actually look under the covers, it's pretty non-standard way of doing message passing. We do a post for every message and master has an endpoint for every message that it receives. For launch tasks, for example, we have a launch tasks message endpoint and the driver sends a post to this. And then we have this fancy header called lib process from and this is a custom header that Mesos understands. It looks at this and says, okay, this is coming from this scheduler and from this IP and port. And it actually opens a new connection to send back any responses. And if you if have dealt with Mesos, um, any HTTP APIs, you would realize that it's really bad um, design 
uh, to have the master open connections back because you can't use your scheduler behind firewalls, for example. So even if the scheduler can open up a connection to the master, master cannot talk back because master cannot open a connection back. And these days, um, the nice fancy thing is to run everything inside containers. So if you're running scheduler inside a container, you're out of luck. You have to do a lot of uh, hacks to get that working, maybe run in the host namespace and stuff like that. And it also makes network partitions really hard to deal with. And when you have two connections to deal with, it, there are lots of corner cases. We fix this between the master and agent, and it involved a lot of hacks and clever thinking, and we definitely don't want to do that again with the scheduler. We want to make the connection logic much simpler so that we can deal with this uh, much easily. And of course, we never had any good versioning story for Mesos. Um, the only versions that we currently have are the release version. Uh, so the Mesos um, project itself has a version which comes out every two weeks or sorry, every four weeks or so. And if you're an admin and you're hitting our metrics API, for example, the endpoint, you get a JSON blob, but you don't know what the schema is. Uh, you probably have to look into our code to understand what uh, what the JSON looks like. And if it changes from version to version, you have no idea. And what some of the operators have ended up doing is they actually hit state.json, get the version out of it, and then have a big switch statement in their um, and then monitoring tool saying, oh, this is 23, then this is the schema 24, this is the schema, it's horrible. Um, and the last thing is, it's actually also a pain for the Meso developers ourselves when we write code because the way it's currently structured to provide the native uh, bindings for different frameworks, like uh, to give the Java bindings and Python bindings, it's a piece of boilerplate that we don't want to deal with. Um, so what, what this means is that when we want to add a new feature, it actually takes a lot of effort from a Mesos developer point of view to add that feature into the uh, Mesos code base, which means it's gonna take a while for the frameworks to get this feature. So we want to get away from it. So I would say like the current APIs are good and got us this far. Um, I think it got us four to five years and we saw this huge ecosystem develop, but I think we can do the next evolution of the API, which can give us a better ramp up for new frameworks. Um, so as Hardware Dent would say, you either die a hero or just get replaced by something better. So what's better? So I said this is what's uh, stopping us from doing a 1.0 was because we are not that happy with the current APIs that we had. So we wanted to do something better for 1.0 and that's where we drew the line in the sand. Um, so the main goals for us for 1.0 that we wanted to have consistent APIs. And by that I mean, if you're, whether you're an admin or a framework, you should have a similar interface to deal with. You don't have to learn a new way if you're a framework and if you're admin, you want to have to deal with a new way. It should, be, should look very fam familiar. And of course we want versioning. I mean, I think that's, uh, you don't need to say that really loud. Um, so what is the new HTTP API? Uh, how does it look like? Uh, it's very simple. It's actually based on standard HTTP 1.1. So you can just use your favorite HTTP libraries and it's versioned. And surprisingly, it's actually well documented. So we have a user doc that you can go to and actually look at the whole thing, the control flow, how it works. You don't have to reverse engineer or ask on the mailing list on what this means and how these things work, or you don't have to read the code to understand the control flow. And if you're a REST fan, um, it's kind of disappointing because it's not really REST. Um, and uh, mainly because we wanted, the, one of the goals, as I'll talk later, is that we wanted it to look very familiar with the current API so that people don't have to learn a very, like, completely new language. And not being REST, but being a good HTTP API was good enough. So in this iteration, we didn't bother trying to be, like, REST. Um, so what are the new Mesos APIs? So as I said, there are four APIs, and they're hosted by different components based on what API it is. So if it's a master, that's, uh, there's a new endpoint called API of even scheduler, and I'm gonna talk about versioning at the end of the talk. And then if it's an agent, and it hosts a new API called executor that executors use to talk to it, and both the master and the agent, of course, uh, export the admin API, and through this you get the statistics and state and stuff like that, and master and agent talk through the internal API themselves using HTTP. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus mainly on the scheduler HTTP API, mainly because that's the one that's been most fleshed out uh, and that's coming up 
pretty soon. So, and hopefully that will give an idea of how the other APIs would look like. So the scheduler HTTP API is based on this fundamental building blocks called uh, calls and events. Um, so calls are basically things that the scheduler sends to the master, and events are the things that the master sends back to the scheduler. Things like status updates and offers are events, whereas launch task or kill task are calls. And the way the connections work in this world is that it's the scheduler that op opens the connections to the master, and master doesn't open connections back. It uses the same connection to send back events. So a typical scheduler would actually open a persistent connection, and um, on that connection, we send a streaming response back, and that's the one that we use to send all the events. And for sending other calls, the scheduler basically can use one or more connections and just send calls, and the master will accept those calls on those connections, and all the synchronous events are still sent back on the persistent connection. So why did we design it this way? Um, so there are three guiding principles, I would say, that uh, guided us on how we want to do this. One was simplicity. Uh, as I said, completely uh, being a good standard HTTP API means we could use your off-the-shelf HTTP client libraries and don't depend on uh, libmesos anymore. And you can just write a framework on, in more languages than what we currently have. As long as you have HTTP library support in your language, you're good to go. The next one is upgradability. I uh, touched on this a little bit before. Um, so basically, we wanted it to look really similar. And um, so for example, in the old API, if it's kill task call, in this new world, it's going to be called call.kill. So it's, it's very familiar. So it doesn't take you a lot to learn the new API. And the last one was extensibility. So having this uh, fundamental building blocks of calls and events means it's going to be a boon for developers. Uh, adding a new call or event is just adding a f new field in the protobuf. And as you'll see later in the demo from Isabel, it's really, really easy. No boilerplate at all. That's awesome. So let's look a little bit closely on what are the actual calls and uh, how do they map to the old API. So we have a subscribe call and tear down, which I can start and stop the control flow. And most of the other calls, you can see it's easily relatable. The only new call that we added is a shutdown call, and this is a shutdown call to shut down your executor. Um, so previously, you just have to have that logic in the executor to decide when it needs to shut down, but now um, a scheduler can actually send the signal through Mesos. Like, much like a kill task, you can actually do a shutdown executor. And on the event side, again, it's very familiar if you look at the old API and the new API. Uh, you get a subscribe initially, and then you get offers, and uh, messages, status updates. And the only new thing that we added here are heartbeats uh, that are sent periodically by the master. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so how does the protocol look? Uh, how do you interact with this? Uh, so every call is HTTP POST request, plain and simple. And the calls could be encoded in JSON or protobuf. Those are the two formats that we uh, support to start with. And the first call that uh, a scheduler is going to send is subscribe. That's the one. That's a persistent connection. It gets a 200 OK with a streaming response, and you just incrementally uh, decode this response. And the events are formatted in record IO format. I'm going to show you an example on what that means. And we use un under the covers chunked encoding, of course. And most schedulers don't have to deal with it because it's going to be dealt by this HTTP clients uh, most often. And then all uh, non-subscribe calls just at get a 202 accepted, and this just means that master has done some validation. Doesn't necessarily mean it has finished processing, because in a distributed system, it's really hard to say when something is finished processing. Um, so 202 just means that uh, master has done validation, and it's trying to process it, but it could fail out at that point, so no guarantees. Not getting a call back uh, like a 202 or a 200 means there's something bad going on, and you probably want to disconnect and uh, resubscribe. So uh, let's look at the subscription request. Um, so the way it looks if you dump the HTTP, it looks like uh, this. Um, so you have the standard headers, um, and you post to the scheduler endpoint. And the first subscription request has So every call has a type that identifies the call. And here it's a subscribe type. And it has information that's needed for subscribe call and its framework info for subscription. And then there's a field called force which I'm going to talk about a little bit when I talk about disconnections and network partitions and how this could be used. And the response that you get back for this one is a HTTP. 
So if you look at a non-subscribe call, something like a kill, this is how it would look, very similar. Uh, all the non-subscribe calls also include a framework ID because master has to recognize which framework ID the calls are coming from. It's a different connection. And then they use the information that's needed in the message. And the response for this is very simple. It gets the two order accepted as soon as uh, it's validated. And if it's not, uh, if the validation is bad, then you probably get a 400, 4XX something. Um, so disconnections and partitions, uh, we believe this, this uh, logic of opening one connection, streaming connection would make it really easy. So the way this works is the master is going to keep track of the persistent connection as the thing that is holding on to the scheduler. And if that connection breaks, it starts a failover timeout as usual. And it's expected that scheduler reconnects within the failover timeout. And the, fail, uh, and the force bit that we saw in the subscribe message is mainly to deal with uh, network partitions and failover cases. So for example, uh, if you're writing a high available scheduler and if you have two instances of the scheduler trying to talk to the master at the same time because uh, you have a bug in your later election logic. So master has to break the tie um, between two competing subscribe calls. Who should it allow? So the force field basically allows master to decide if the force is true, then you're allowed in and, uh, and the already connected guy is booted out. And if your forces fall, you are not allowed. So we also have some recommendations in our user doc on when you should set with uh, what value based on when you get elected and when you fail over. So go to the design uh, user doc and see if that makes sense. Um, and then the final thing is uh, the periodic heartbeats are sent by the master. And this is just um, a means of making sure we keep the connection alive and we don't want any network intermediate, intermediaries to think that this connection is not working if there are no events. And, just disconnect the connection. And it could also be used by the schedulers. Uh, for example, if there's some network partition cases where the sockets don't close, but you're not getting any heartbeats, then you know that something bad is happening and you can just actually uh, disconnect and reconnect back, hopefully using something like exponential back off. Uh, finally, about uh, versioning. Uh, so the versioning also, we were guided by three principles. Uh, we wanted to, the version to be really explicit. Um, so for that, we put the version in the URL, as you can see, the version would be in the URL itself, like v1, instead of doing something like content uh, negotiation or uh, using accept headers or query parameters. It's also really simple because when you write monitoring tools like collect D or, uh, or you're just using curl, it's much easier if you just can hit a version URL than doing something headers uh, using a dash D in curl and putting up the headers and sending it. Um, and the other important thing that we did was that we unified the version of all the APIs under one version. Um, so all the APIs would be bumped at the same time. This is mainly because we wanted to avoid the version explosion problem. We didn't want to debug a case where someone says, okay, I have this problem and my scheduler is using V2 API in my cluster that's running V3 internal API and my executor is running V6 API. And it's gonna be horrible. And, we, and writing that code in message to maintain all those combinations is going to be horrible. So we just decided to stick uh, one version for all APIs, and we as Mesos developers would uh, agree that we are not going to bump that major API often. Um, and the other nice thing about having a unified version is that we can tie that back to the release version. And the way we are tying that is that the major version of Mesos release is going to be the API version. So if it's a 1.0, 1.4.0, or whatever, it's, it's going to support the V1 API. And the next version of the API would be released sometime in the previous release version. For example, V2 would be released in 115.0, for example, so that people can play with the new API. But it's not considered stable until the very last release of the one series. So let's say 1.20 is the last release of one uh, of the one um, series. The, the V2 API is not considered stable until it's 1.20, so that you can do a live upgrade with 1.20, and then we cut at 2.0.0 release version. And then we have a stable a V2 API at that point. And as I mentioned, version bumping, major version, we hopefully don't uh, bump it often. It's probably going to be once a year or so unless, um, so we also have this contract on what things we consider uh, backwards compatible and what things we don't consider backwards compa compatible, and it's in the user doc. So if the schedulers can adhere to this contract, then they shouldn't worry about it. We could easily add new calls and events and you shouldn't break. And the minor version is bumped regularly because we wanted to give a good cadence for users. A lot of times we get questions on, hey, when is the next release coming out? And so far we have done feature-based releases, but we decided that um, we have enough momentum in the project now that we could do time-based releases. 
So it's likely going to be four to eight weeks. Um, going forward, we'll see what works best, but it's going to be a regular cadence that users can expect. So when is 1.0 coming out? I think we started off with this question. So this is how the road to 1.0 looks like. Um, so in 24.0, we uh, introduced the V1 scheduler API. And in the next release, we plan to wrap up the executor API and the admin API. And somewhere between that and 1.0, we might also do the internal API, which we haven't decided whether we want that as a blocker for 1.0, but so a couple releases from now, you should expect a 1.0 Mesos release and you can all have party. That's pretty much all I had, and then I'm gonna give it to Isabel. She's gonna show a demo with how to um, play with the new HTTP API. Okay, <laughs> so let's, two seconds. Please mirror, okay, it doesn't mirror. Sorry about this. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Isabel, and as Vina said, I am a software engineer at uh, Mesosphere. I'm here to um, come on. There you go. Great. So now, perfect. <laughs> so now I am going to demo the Mesos our uh, new uh, HTTP API um, for schedulers. Um, let me start by showing you something that wasn't possible before. Uh, here I have just a curl uh, that does a post to uh, the master endpoint API v1 scheduler with just a JSON uh, that corresponds to the subscribe call. So basically this is on my curl that is age and I just Launch it, and here I go. I have just subscribed to my message master. Uh, he sent back my, my framework ID. I receive a heartbeat, and I started receiving offers. And that was just with a simple curl. We can see on the, on the message UI, uh, if, sorry about that. Great. Uh, so we can see in the message UI that great message. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, that my curl was correctly registered, and uh, it's uh, my master is sending him offers. But it's just a curl, it's not a real scheduler. So we created a client in Go uh, very easily. Uh, this looks pretty impressive because I have lots of uh, files, but it's actually just because I decided to cut a functionality profile. Um, if we go to the code, we see that uh, what I actually do is, uh, for example, for lunch, I just create the call corresponded to the lunch. So here I just do uh, um, my protobuf call for lunch, and I use something very simple uh, that does the send. So what does the send does? It just uses an HTTP post, uh, like, just like my curl, on the master endpoint and it fills it with the body I sent. Uh, just note here that uh, I am setting my content type to product buff, but I'm, we also support JSON now, so I'm receiving back JSON. So my client 
basically just implements the library. It's a native three-line client that, for example, for the main purposes of demo, uh, does launch and stand kills and just does a lib launch task with the right parameters. So as we just saw, this cannot be replaced by just simple curls. It's just an HTTP post with, this, with the right body for the right command. So let's launch the client. So here I just do my client. Just like the curl, it subscribed successfully uh, and it received offers. So we can go back to the UI and see that my MesoScan demo uh, it's uh, well registered and well subscribed, receiving offers on the stream. So here, I can I make on this demo uh, for my client. I'm I'm reading on studying uh, my commands, and the way I did this is that I just launch uh, tasks on Docker containers. So I just precise my command the Docker image I want to launch my task on. And um, my favorite command for demos is to ping google.com. Because that way, I know that if something's wrong, it's either my fault or that we can all watch out for Google stack options. <laughs> so, please don't break. Okay, I lost my connection. Perfect. Demos are always fine. Oh yeah, I completely lost my connection. Okay, let me repair this. Uh, not like this. Oh wow. This is fun. Please bear with me. If my connection is not completely broken. I'm able just to uh, escape this. Um, let me just launch. Great. Okay. I have a video, <laughs> but I, I really want to get you guys to uh, to see that if. My Temex is still working, then my master and, and agent are still there. So I can just uh, kill my client and uh, relaunch it and show you. Oh, great. Awesome. So, awesome. So, okay, I lost my connection and Temusk magic made that I don't see my client anymore. But, <laughs> um, oof, <laughs> ping at google.com went through for both me and Google, yay. Um, so, great, our client is working and um, um, let me just <laughs> continue my awesome demo. <laughs> by uh, killing my team uh, I will never judge any demo anymore. <laughs> 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 um, great, so now everything's dead. <laughs> uh, I can just uh, launch my master again. And, uh, well, this is still touching, great. Uh, SSH in, no, don't want to test with Tmux anymore. And I'm just going to launch another agent. And let's start again. So, like I said, uh, we, we wrote this client. Uh, here I just resubscribed, I'm receiving the offers of my agent. And I launch again my my task, so, well, let's see if we're lucky again. <laughs> uh, great, so, like you see, I received my event back, my uh, status update for my task, that's running, and I received offers back. 
So what I can do also is that here I see my, ta my task running and I can also kill it. So I can just kill my task and pass the task ID, my task is killed. Here I can update he this, it's properly killed. What I just did, it's again just another post with the right body to the master endpoint. So this, this client, these curls, everything that I'm doing, I, I can do it anywhere. I can do it on my host, I can do it on my laptop, I can do it on any NAT or behind any firewall. I won't be uh, having any problems with that anymore. Great, so the purpose here is to demonstrate the three principles we have behind the HTTP uh, rationality. So I just demonstrated how simple it is to uh, use the new API by just doing basic HTTP requests. Uh, the second principle is upgradability. For this, I, I wanted to upgrade a framework, a Mesos framework. So Vault uh, is a Mesos framework that was presented here at MesosCon last year uh, to uh, demonstrate um, the Docker integration. And I decided just to upgrade Vault to the new, uh, new API. So like Vinod said, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, there's a bunch of deletes, uh, just basically I'm replacing the <laughs> executor and uh, schedulers, drivers, by just calling my small library that I just showed you. Uh, it's basically the same thing as before, but I just do a launch task with the right parameters. Uh, please check out this PR for more information. Uh, it's a POC to just show how easy it's to port a framework to the new API. So uh, let's launch Vault this time. So I launched Vault, and because it's using the same library as my other client, uh, it logs the same way. It uh, subscribed successfully my framework, and if we wait a bit, it's going to receive offers. I can also just launch the UI. Other thing I want to point out also is that when I upgraded Vault, I didn't touch to anything else but just the calls that I do uh, to this, to the, with the scheduler API. So here I have my vault running, and let me try to launch the task. So here I just uh, launched the task with the UI. Um, I kept the default parameters. I launched a small LS on a busy box. If I go back to uh, Mesos, the Mesos UI, here I have that my Mesos gun uh, demo task finished because it was just a simple LS. Uh, I can see in the sandbox uh, the execution and everything just worked as before. Uh, the framework was just upgraded and now it's just using the, the, new, the small library I wrote, basically just doing posts. So I cannot, in my case, I cannot talk about upgradability without pairing it with extensibility. And that's the third principle. So. Basically, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been wanting to um, add support for Creu and Mesos uh, for a long time. So I just, um, like just did a small POC for uh, supporting Creu uh, checkpointing uh, tasks on Mesos. So let me just, um, basically show you uh, where I am, where am I? Oh, great. Um, yeah, so uh, basically I have on my uh, small client in Go, I, uh, I added on my library uh, on the product above definitions, I can show you that I added just a call, an event, and um, and uh, if I can do this, and um, it doesn't break, great. So here, 
I, uh, these are the definitions for events, right? Uh, so uh, here I have my message event that you can see, subscribe, offers, everything. And I just added a type, crew, that you can see here. The message basically uh, has its own styles. I either checkpointed or restart the image. So uh, I did the same for uh, the call. I just added a, a, f a type field for call, crew, that basically has the same. It just uh, either checkpoints or restores the, uh, the image. So I'm basically looping around. Uh, I come back to the principle of simplicity. I just add an event, add a call, and then I just make my whole new feature of course, in this case, it's just a POC. But my whole new feature available for any scheduler. Uh, the, the only thing the scheduler has to do now is uh, add a handler. So in my case here, I added another file because I like functionalities for file. And um, uh, with a checkpoint method for my library. It just fills up the call crew uh, with the right parameters and sends it again with my post and the right body. So let's try it out. I can just launch my client again. Uh, it's described again. Everything's working. Uh, so I am uh, I'm going to launch uh, and I'm not going to be greedy this time. I'm going to do just a small sleep. So the task is running. Uh, basically what my POC does, it's, it just, it's just a POC, so I just wanted to show that messages can support Creo. So I just, for now, shell out Creo and checkpoint the image. What, does that, what this does is uh, it actually stops. The, I don't pass any flags to, uh, to prevent the stop of the, of the process, and it takes the image and put it on varlib, docker, and the uh, create image uh, directory. So I added a handler, and I read and study in. I pass just the task here. OK. Here. And the task failed. We were expecting that, because the task just got stopped by crew. So if I go back. Uh, in another, in another um, I see that my sleep wasn't long enough. Uh, great. So just relaunch another one. And then I can show you that if I don't do Docker PS, I'll have my sleep running. And I just pointed another image, but I'm just going to show you that it's there. On varlib Docker, I call it create image directory, and I have my image there. I can checkpoint another one, but I already emptied my <laughs> directory so you, to show you that it actually did it. Um, so here I just have uh, my checkpointed image, and I can continue my POC uh, implementing restore, the restore of that image. Um, so yeah, just like, a, just like I said before, um, we're looping around uh, simplicity, extensibility, and upgradability. Uh, this can also be added easily in Vault now because I can just add a simple call to please restore uh, and checkpoint this image for me on my UI in Vault. Um, thanks for listening and for bearing through my technical problems. <laughs> um, Again, simplicity, upgradability, extensibility. Uh, we have to thank also uh, other contributors that made uh, 0, 24, and the new API for schedulers uh, possible. So Ben Maller, Anand Mazenbar, Ben Heidmar, obviously. 
uh, Marco Masenzio and Alexander Rojas. So uh, thanks, are there any questions?